concerns and attendance regarding items not on the agenda. Seeing none, we will move on to number three, the monthly fire department. Good evening, Steve Pelna, fire chief. Just want to go over real quick our, our monthly report so you know what you're, you're looking at there. Um, as we scroll down, you'll see our total monthly number uh, followed by the, the subsequent municipalities, mutual aid that we're given to our, to our neighbors or neighbors of neighbors, average manpower uh, per call. On the right, we break out our, our training hours and our activity hours. Uh, activity hours are more admin duties, meetings, that, that sort of thing, but training is directly training for different um, types of responses, that sort of thing uh, with that. The, the property loss, <clears throat> we have the before and after, uh, so those, uh, those items that are in jeopardy versus what the actual loss is from the event. And underneath, we showcase any significant events that happened in the last 30 days. Uh, on to the next page, we have a nice, uh, pretty bar graph, or I'm sorry, a, a pie chart. Um, so fires, um, as they're broken out, are, are actual actual fires, damage associated with that. Rescue or emergency calls, uh, these are gonna be motor vehicle accidents, elevator rescues, uh, anytime we assist uh, Good Fellowship or any other uh, EMS uh, agency. Hazardous conditions, fuel spills, carbon monoxide uh, releases, alarms, um, gas leaks, uh, that sort of thing. Um, next, we have service calls. So that's anything where we're called out to assist the public. So that could be something as simple as I had a pipe burst. Can you guys come out and shut it off for us and help us out with the water in our property, that sort of thing. Good intent, that might be something along the lines of uh, somebody thinks they see smoke, they call us out, we get out there and find out it's steam. So somebody had the best intentions for calling 911, we get out there and find, you know, it's not a true true emergency. And then finally, our false alarm um, or false calls, which uh, do make up a, a large part of our, our calls are um, automatic fire alarms, uh, cooking, dust, um, expired detectors, steam, that sort of thing that might set the alarm off. So that kind of gives you an overview of, of our report. So as you, as you get them each month, you kind of know what, what you're looking at specifically. Um, we also have uh, last year's report, if we can do that real quick um, as well. Uh, most significantly, we didn't get a chance to, to speak about it in January, but we had a, a two alarm fire on South Franklin Street. Um, no civilian injuries. Uh, luckily, it was during the time when college was not in session. It was primarily a college housing. And there were unfortunately three firefighter injuries, uh, two from our department and one from a mutual aid. It was icy that night. We had uh, a series of falls. One that ended up in a, a minor neck injury, an eye injury, and then also a burn. Uh, first thing, crews from the second floor that came down on them and. Uh, one of our one of our guys actually had some some neck and and burns around his ears, um, but a tremendous uh, outpouring of support by our mutual aid. Uh, it was a it was a large event, uh, not only um, on the fire side but definitely the the police department. Um, that I was able to send a, a note to to Chief Moorhead. Um, his staff was there uh, immediately, helped us evacuate, make sure all the apartments were clear. Um, and then also good fellowship as well, not only to help treat the, the individuals that were injured, but to stand by if anybody else was, and also more importantly, what we call a rehab, which you'll see in, in Chief Brogan's report. Um, as, our, as our folks come out of the building, keeping them warm, uh, checking uh, their vital signs, making sure they don't have anything going on internally that would, would cause them. And in January, we had a, uh, a shed fire um, out in East Bradford uh, Township off uh, Route 52. So that was a 10 by 10 uh, shed for, for storage. And we also had a significant house fire on Todd Way in West Goshen Township. That fire was caused by 
from the from the fireplace. So they had a fireplace that extended. Let's see what we have. Any questions for me? I do not have any questions. Yeah, this is more of a comment that goes for the whole meeting. Um, my first committee meeting of this committee, and I just wanted to thank you for um, breaking it down in a way that was easy to understand. As sure. like, um, as I get acclimated to this committee, and I'm really looking forward to uh, learning a lot more about what y'all do. Um, every single one of you does jobs I could literally do. Um, I just don't have the mental or physical fortitude to do any of it. So I really appreciate what you guys are doing. And again, I really appreciate uh, the way you're breaking this down. So thank okay. you. I appreciate that. Also, I wanted to introduce uh, Justin McClure. He's our assistant fire chief and also March, who is our public information officer. Um, Dave and his team made up a, a map of the borough for us that all of you are listed on it at, along with your location. We're not gonna put it out on the internet or anything like that. We also have all, all of your contact information, email address, cell phone. Um, I probably in the in the past you heard from from Dave at some point. If we're out on an incident, Dave is actually in the command post with us, and he's feeding information while Justin or myself may be um, obviously tasked with the operation of the the incident. Um, Dave is able to help us out to communicate, um, counsel. Uh, Sean and his team as well. Um, so we have your contact information and it's worked out great thus far, um, especially if it's in your ward. Um, the smaller incidents, we might just um, go to go to the individual council member, but um, for larger, we're putting it out to everybody um, and it might be something we wake you up for if it's that bad. Um, unfortunately, Mike uh, was in his uh, in his bathroom and he looked out and he saw the the fire across the street from his house so that was pretty easy to tell so when he got a call from Dave he was not surprised um, but uh, yeah great thing we have in place so uh, that that's there so hopefully the communication is working for you if you have any you know any tweaks on that please uh, please let me know. I appreciate that and I think I've gotten an email for something that happened in my district uh, in, in my ward. And I'd like to echo Nick's comments. Thank you for the educational. Of course. I think you three new uh, committee members up here. So it was very informative. Thank you very much. Great. All right. Thank you. Good evening. James Moorhead, Chief of Police, and welcome, Chairperson Dorsey, uh, Mr. Allen, Ms. Vaccaro. Uh, just to echo what the Fire Chief Steve Cullen has said, looking forward to working with this new committee. Any questions, concerns, public safety, quality of life issues, please make sure you reach out immediately. Uh, my direct report is obviously to the mayor, but I'm always available to all of you for whatever whatever you desire, need, and I'll try to uh, make sure that, I know Ms. Vaccaro and Ms. Brown have been down for tours. Uh, uh, Ms. Dorsey can make some time, come on down, see the building, uh, first floor, and then also take advantage of possibly riding along uh, one or more officers to see what they do day in and day. Ride along for as little or as long as you would like, and I can arrange that for you. Uh, for, uh, we're going to be covering the month of January. I'll give you a quick explanation on that. I just want to cover uh, December of 2021 will be found in your year-end report. I left a number of copies on the dais, and I also have it uploaded online. You go to the police department, go to annual reports in 2021, you can find the complete uh, year-end report. And again, I left copies up on the dais as well. For the month of January, the police department handled 3,422 calls for service, of which 2,570 of those were in the borough. Go down to the next page. Um, you're going to hear me talk about part one and part two crime. Part one crime, you see uh, pictured on the left there, part one crime 
my talk about that is serious crime that we have to report to the state and federal government. Serious crime consists of rapes, robberies, homicides, arsons, assaults, motor vehicle theft. I said robberies uh, and so on. Part two crime is going to be your less serious crime, almost like nuisance crime. It's going to be public intoxications, disorderly conducts, forgeries, frauds, vandalisms. Doesn't make them any less important. They're obviously uh, take more uh, precedence sometimes to uh, quality of life issues in the borough. But as you can see on the graph, part one crime for the month of January compared to 2021's January part one crime, uh, we're seeing about a 32% spike. Uh, don't throw a lot at that number. Uh, number's still extremely low for the borough's uh, last 25 year period. We keep seeing sinking, sinking part one crime in the borough and this is no different. Last year was an anomaly along with 2020 with the pandemic and we saw a, a big reduction in crime in 2020 and uh, part of 2021. Uh, part two crime is also up for the month. If we go to the next slide. There's a glance at part one crime for the month of January. And you can see all of that uh, crime reported takes place in the areas of assault, small amount of burglaries and thefts and motor vehicles. We're all following the news. You see carjackings are well over 160 in the city of Philadelphia. Um, knock on wood, uh, not seen any carjackings in the borough to date this year, uh, but we have had people leaving cars running while they run in for coffee or something else and their car gets stolen. So um, have been trending up with motor vehicle theft, but I just wanna let you know that we have not seen a any carjacking activity. Um, but assaultive behavior is up, and this is largely due to the bar district is where we're seeing most of this crime occur. Thefts, I just want to remind the public again that package theft is on the rise again, so please be mindful, work with your neighbors, uh, take your packages off the porch as soon as you can. Um, I just had a, a woman stop me in the back parking lot while I was getting ready to talk to Ms. Dorsey wanted us to go do a well-being check on a resident on East Bernard Street. And good news is the resident's okay. Actually not there at the moment, but the officers discovered a large quantity of package theft boxes on the back porch that have all been ripped open and gone through. So uh, hopefully we can get, get something from that. Go to the last slide in the monthly report. You'll see that this is all part two crime. And this is a... Uh, forgery, vandalism, sex offenses, narcotics, DUIs, liquor law, public intoxication, disorderly conduct, and all other. All other would be like urinating in public, other nuisance type crime. And we're currently uh, seeing about a uh, second. Yeah, we're seeing a uh, spike in part two crime again, but again, it's because of the anomaly of the overall. Uh, Police departments functioning on all levels. We are down a number of personnel. We had an officer injured in January. Uh, officer uh, received a number of rib injuries. I'm happy to report she's now, she's now back to work, which is good. Uh, January 21st of this year, we saw the retirement of a 25 year veteran of the force, Corporal Christopher Craig, bless you, uh, retired on January 21st and on February 1st, one of our records administrators, Cindy Hill, retired from the borough as well after 23 years of service. So we wish them both well. Um, happy to report that on January 20th and 21st of this year, the police department finally reached the finish line with state accreditation. The mayor's gonna cover this extensively next week at borough council but I just want to report to the public safety committee that we passed with flying colors. It was a very difficult process. The, uh, the officers, all of the support and civilian staff of the police department, um, at, you know, just nothing but utmost professionalism. Uh, we were ready for this assessment. Um, 
you know, they came in and they were extremely thorough over the two day period. Um, but I'm happy to report that we're moving on for state approval, which the mayor and myself and a small contingent will be uh, going to Harrisburg on March 2nd for that. And then uh, finally, I talked about this in December at public safety. Uh, the borough is now the first police department in the state of Pennsylvania to open and operate an emergency prote protection from abuse order um, uh, for victims of domestic and other assault of behavior where they cannot maybe get to the district court that's open on an evening or a weekend, they can report here as an emergency site and complete everything via Zoom at the police department with the judge. This past weekend was our first weekend up and running with that, and we had four cases come to the borough, so didn't expect to see that many so quick, um, but everything else is doing well. Any questions you have? Explain that a little bit more for that. It's the first in the state, you said, the police department that's providing the emergency PBA? Yep, so, uh, so during business hours, uh, victims of domestic assault uh, or uh, people who are, uh, feel that they need a protection from abuse, they go to the county courthouse to domestic violence and a petition uh, court to award them a temporary protection from abuse order. During night hours, there's an on-call judge somewhere in the county and on, we and on all weekends. Uh, for instance, this past weekend, the on-call judge was Honeybrook. So anybody in Chester County that would need to apply for emergency protection from abuse order, which passed, would have to drive to Honeybrook Township to apply for that. Not always feasible, uh, especially for you know, certain uh, people in a position with children, maybe not even having a vehicle uh, to get to the court to do that. So in coordination with uh, President Judge uh, John Hall, uh, President District Justice John Bailey and the Crime Victim Center, uh, now partnered, and we're the first police department in the state to offer such a service where a victim from West Goshen could come here instead of going to Honeybrook. All the paperwork's completed here, it's scanned in and faxed by members of our department. And when the judge is ready to Zoom call with the victim, they do it right from here. And uh, the judge approves it, all the completed paperwork is then emailed back to the police department, printed out, stapled, and given to the victim so that they can go to their local police department to have that protection from abuse order served. Thank you, Chief. Yep. Thank you as well for the explanation of part one and part two yeah. uh, for that. Uh, Sheila, any questions? Um, yes, we're still going after noisy yeah. vehicles. <laughs> so um, congrats on the accreditation um, progress. That's great. So. I mean, we've been talking about that, you and I, for like yeah. two and a half years. So that's that's amazing. Um, so for the March 2nd date, when you go to the state, is that more of like a formality? Like you're, we're pretty much out of the woods now with that? Yeah, the state commission will be convening at a, at a hotel conference room in, in Harrisburg, downtown Harrisburg. Uh, they're all in receipt of our completed report by the assessment team. They're reviewing that now. There'll be discussion on March 2nd. They may they may ask the mayor a question. They may ask me a question, but they will take a vote. There's a 17 member board that will vote on March 2nd. We don't expect uh, any any ripples with that. We think we're gonna go through clean and um, we would be awarded state accreditation a, a, as a result of that meeting on that date in Harris. Yeah, that's, that's great. And then I know this was a, a huge push to get here, um, what does it look like to maintain accreditation moving forward? So uh, it, it's a deep, it's a deep dive. It's a lot of work on both uh, the personnel uh, part of the borough. They have to maintain strict training standards, policy standards. Uh, department is going to be reassessed at three years. So just to give you an example for. January 21st and 22nd, we had to meet 
139 proofs and 379 standards of those proofs. Uh, uh, for example, when we arrest somebody and we're gonna bring that prisoner to the station, it's now a requirement uh, because of accreditation that we double lock the handcuffs. Uh, you know, that prevents the handcuffs from tightening on somebody in the back seat of a car. That's not a standard anywhere, but we do it because that's accreditation brings us to that level. State uh, is now uh, getting very close to approving radar for police, school police departments. You can't get radar unless you're accredited. So that's another bonus. And then the biggest thing for uh, me as the chief is that this is gonna reduce liability and risk to the borough because the officers are, are held now to that highest of standards. They have to perform at that level all the time or there's obviously more severe uh, penalties and, and write-ups for, for not performing those duties. So everybody's well aware of what's what's involved with this. It's not a, not a window sticker. It's not something that we take lightly. We're gonna have to work really hard to keep accreditation because those 139 proofs, 379 standards, we have to do that every year for so that when they come back for that reassessment, 139 times three and 379 times three, and you could do the math. I mean, we now have to provide a contact solution in the cell block. And all, I mean, just, it's, it's crazy when you uh, really drill down and, and get a look at everything that we're now required to do that we're not required by anybody to do. It's just, a, it's a state recommended standard in order to uh, make that highest standard of, of level. And it's, uh, it's a huge accomplishment for all the men and women upstairs. And, and the assessment team who came from all over the state was nothing but impressed. Mayor even came in that day to, to sit down with the assessment team. They really appreciated that because it shows the investment. It's not just a police department investment, it's a borough investment. That went a long way. Awesome, yeah, thanks so much and congrats. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions for Chief Moorhead? We will move on to item number five, the report from Good Fellowship Ambulance, Chief Bergen. Good evening, my name is Chaz Bergen. I'm the EMS Chief from Good Fellowship Ambulance. We are the ambulance provider for the Borough of Westchester. Uh, same thing, I just want to run through our report, kind of a little more detail so you understand what you're looking at. Um, I'll disclose I'm a data nerd, so I love this stuff. So feel free to ask any questions you have. Um, so this first thing here is just the total call volume. I left 2021 up here so you can kind of see the trend. Keep in mind the last two years with COVID, uh, we really saw impacts on our call volume. So summer last year is when we really saw that call volume come back uh, and actually much higher than we expected. This really the surge on healthcare. So uh, there were 181 calls last month in Westchester Borough. That's about 27% of our total call volume, provide service to 10 municipalities. Um, and then last month there were 664 total for all 10 of those. So. Uh, we'll just scroll through here. Day of the week is pretty self-explanatory. That ebbs and flows seasonally. During the summer, we'll see the weekdays go down, the weekends come up, and then it kind of transitions to the year. Go and keep scrolling there. By hour, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. are typically our busiest hours. Uh, that's our trend we've always seen. Uh, same thing, when college is in session, we'll see those evening overnight hours come up a little bit. Uh, so you'll see that through the years, we'll look at these. Uh, we list the hospitals that our patients are going to. Uh, just geographically, most of them go to Chester County Hospital. Um, you know, I'll talk about hospitals and the situation we're in. But uh, we do take a fair amount of patients to Paoli Hospital. Uh, we also break out if they go there for trauma services. They are a trauma center. They're the only trauma center in the county. So if a patient needs trauma services, uh, they always go to the hospital. Call outcomes here. Uh, the BLS and ALS is really just a different it, difference in the level of care provided. ALS is a higher level care provider. BLS is more basic level care. So something life threatening or something that could be life threatening is treated at the ALS level. So it, it shows you how many patients were transported at the ALS level versus the BLS level. Everything underneath of that are patients that were not transported, uh, and whatever outcome that may be. Um, nice little pie chart there to show. The are going. Uh, so this is all our miscellaneous stuff, and a lot of this came out of feedback from council members and township supervisors. So if there's something you want to see on here, let us know. Uh, you know, we had a request several years ago that uh, the townships and the borough wanted to see how many calls were on campus. Uh, so 
last month, the college was uh, remote. Not a lot of people on campus, so there's only 10 calls on campus. Uh, and again, that's a seasonal thing. Drug and alcohol suspicion. So this is when there is some clear indicator. So the patient admits to using something. There is drug paraphernalia. Obviously, there's alcohol bottles, something like that. So 16% uh, of the calls in Westchester Borough had some kind of alcohol or drug in them. Um, our average times, we watch these uh, a lot. Kim knows I'm crazy about these. Uh, we like our, our crews to be on the road as much as possible, obviously. Uh, so we monitor their times every month. Uh, the, you know, the, the notable thing here is that dispatch to available, which is that bottom one. We're seeing that kick up every month because of the amount of time they're waiting at the hospital for beds. Uh, and just with the situation we're in, which um, we'll speak about. This last thing here is just the types of calls. Uh, so what you're seeing is actually what the, the type of call entered by the 911 center when somebody calls 911. Um, these stay pretty consistent. There's not really big jumps in the types of calls we see. Um, those top three or four are typically what we see every single month. Uh, are there any questions on those data points at all? So we actually send two reports every month, which you'll see online. One report is our entire coverage area and then one specific to Westchester Borough here. So we'll cover the Westchester Borough one in this meeting, just in the interest of time. But if you have questions about the larger report, by all means, let me know. Um, outside of this, uh, hospital closures is the hot topic right now. Uh, so Jennersville closed December 31st, Brandywine closed January 31st. Uh, you know, the impact to us is the majority of these patients are coming to Chester County now uh, and creating some pretty significant delays. So last month, our average was about a 34 minute for a bed at the hospital. Um, and that got better for a couple weeks, but the last week or two, it's been getting bad again. Uh, and a lot of that's related to behavioral health patients. Uh, unfortunately, the catch-all is they sit in the emergency department until they can be placed in an inpatient, inpatient facility. Uh, that's taking days or weeks. So we have behavioral health patients living in the emergency departments for days and weeks. Uh, so we're working regionally on a solution for that. Um, you know, it's not, a good solution at this point, but we're certainly working on it to try to get it resolved. Uh, and then COVID cases are down. I'm sure you know that by now. Um, you know, we really dropped off in the last couple of weeks, which has been great in this county. Uh, so we really haven't been seeing any. Uh, well, other than that, is there any questions for me? Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a Thank good one. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is select a member of the Public Safety Committee representative for the Community Cares Committee. That's one of us. <laughs> I don't know that we have to decide it. To, we don't have to decide it tonight. We have to have that decision for next week for the voting session. On. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we can take we can take that offline, and I'm sure someone will volunteer up here. Uh, number seven: Consider the resolution to request abandonment of the State Route Three A Street, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, from Matlack to New Street. Attachment. If I may provide some clarification, this. Item was also on public works uh, committee agenda last night, and there were some questions posed at the committee last night that are going to be answered and be available for everyone at the work session, having to do with the nuts and bolts of the re of the resolution itself. Questions like, "What does the term designation of a Pennsylvania state route mean?" and a clarification of whether or not. We need to weigh in with PennDOT should we want to close Gay Street after the abandonment process is complete. I'm pretty clear on what the resolution says and states and, and thought we were on the rails to get this finished, but I emailed uh, our contact at PennDOT District 6 this morning to get a written clarification on those matters. The reason this is on tonight's agenda is to have the conversation about um, assuming the abandonment process goes through and, and once the resolution gets passed next week, assuming it does, 
uh, it takes a couple months for PennDOT to do what they need to do to formalize the abandonment of three Gay Street in the borough. Uh, once that happens, it'll be our discretion, the borough's discretion, council's discretion to close the road without having temporarily close the road without having to go to PennDOT to ask permission to do so. So tonight's question is about any potential closure of uh, Gay Street this summer. It's been talked about, it's talked a little bit last at the end of last year. So I know we have this evening uh, members of the fire department, police department who want to make some comments and a member member of the uh, John O'Brien from the Westchester bid who want to make some comments about closure of Gay Street for uh, the open air market. Yeah, if we don't mind, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, John O'Brien, Executive Director of Westchester Business Improvement District. Do we have, I sent a memo over that had kind of been worked on as one of the attachments, if we can pull that up. So before I get too deep into the conversation, because I know the fire department, police department have some remarks, um, not sure, and you can instruct me how deep we want to go into this tonight, realizing that this will most likely be a discussion item in front of the full work session, and I don't want to eat up everyone's valuable time by, so just, you let me know how much detail you want me to go into with this. Well, I, I think we've all seen the attachment, right? Mm -hmm. Both from uh, Chief Moorhead and Chief Palma. So I've seen, so if we can have a high level overview of what the area of sure. concern are. So if we skip down to, um, I'll kind of first start the point number seven, it's on the last page with the challenges, and then just go into the how to implement this. And I think, when we talk about the challenges, it might be good after I kind of summarize this, because I know this is where the fire department, police department have some uh, legitimate concerns they might want to weigh in before we go into implementing this. Um, the biggest challenge that we're going to face is right now the work that's been done on Gay Street for Pico has been called Harmony 4. Uh, they refer to these projects as Harmony 4 or Harmony 1 because these projects tie into a substation on Harmony Road. Because I know the, the term sometimes confuses people because uh, it's anything but harmonious. So PICO is currently working on completing Harmony 4. The last section that they have to do is on High Street. There's two blocks basically between Chestnut all the way down to Market Street. They expect to start that those last two blocks in March. Uh, because that is a state road, they're required every time they dig, whether it's night work or day work, to fill it in with hot asphalt. Uh, the mills are closed right now, so they can't engage with that specific part of the project. They think that March 1st they'll be able to get hot asphalt, but that's really all weather dependent. So in reality, it could be mid-March to April until they're really able to get engaged on High Street. After they're finished that section of High Street, the Harmony 4 project will be complete outside of their requirements on mill and overlaying um, so re basically repaving Gay Street. Then they want to start Harmony One. That runs on Market Street from New Street all the way to High Street. Uh, it's the same kind of work where they'll be digging trenches, putting new conduit line, putting, placing new manholes. Having from at least a business perspective, that road closed while Gay Street is closed will pre present some significant challenges on deliveries, traffic patterns, et cetera. Um, I did meet this morning, uh, Al from Pub the Director of Public Works and I met with InfraSource, who's the subcontractor that will be doing this work, as well as PennDOT and PICO to do a site visit on what it will take and what that project involves. I can't say that that meeting presented any different answers. I had originally thought one way to kind of resolve everybody's issues is if we did a closure that started Memorial Day, ended Labor Day, at least it would be something. Um, and asking P Pico, could you start your work in September? The one challenge, just to put all the cards on the table, is the project is bid right now that says it'll take nine months from the start of the project to completion. Now that's their estimate. I think everybody that has been involved with these projects can tell you they are usually wildly optimistic on their timelines. 
So where they would say nine months, I would venture to say 12 to 14 months. So while if they were to agree to start in September and we could do the open air market in 2022 without any problems, that would probably push their work into the summer of 2023. So in some sense, you'd be just kind of punting the problem to another year. So I think it might be a good point I summarized that for either, you know, Chief Pelner or Chief Moorhead kind of weighing, because I know their, their concerns are directly related to this PICO project. But to build off uh, what John was saying, um, we we all agree the work needs to be completed. We we've, we've seen quite a few incidents occur because of the aging infrastructure in a central business district. We've had, uh, unfortunately, one of our uh, other assistants had a had an ear injury while we were operating on a uh, on an odor call in the uh, two, uh, hundred block of East Gay when uh, when one of the manholes there was an explosion below the ground. Um, and he was close by, and luckily he was not burned. But from the shock wave of the explosion, luckily I was behind the um, the post office at the time, so I was shielded by that. But um, we've seen multiple occurrences um, again with this infrastructure, everything from from fires underground, the the manholes, manhole covers being launched into the grounds. Uh, fires underground, carbon monoxide being pushed in the, in the basements of, of buildings within the central business district. But um, from from the beginning of the project, we you know we're we're a partner. We're we're here to help, and we've been here to help since the beginning. Um, very much on the the part of the team to to for the successful completion of the original open air market. Um, we were part of the planning process. We were afforded the opportunity multiple times. Um, to conduct training sessions uptown. We conducted them during the weeknights, on the weekends. Um, and truly what we found through those training sessions and, and also actual incidents during the closure, um, our, our fears came true um, in the fact of, of delays. So uh, those delays range from our response time. So it's not only from the fire station to the incident, um, but also it's our responders, at least from the fire department's perspective, uh, we're 100 percent volunteer. So all of our volunteers need to get to the firehouse. So we have quite a few um, that belong to the station on the first Westchester on the west side of town. They live on the east side. They got to transverse through the central business district to get there and vice versa to the other two stations where they have to, to come through the, the central business district to get there. And it's not only the central business district, as you know, uh, the traffic patterns are affected further out than the central business districts during the closure. So there's definitely a delay with uh, uh, with those folks getting to the firehouse. And also, um, it's a major artery for us, uh, mainly High Street and, and Market Street. So as you have these cascading or domino effects on the, the traffic patterns, it's delaying our time to get elsewhere, um, not only throughout the borough, um, but to our surrounding municipalities. So, so we've seen that. Uh, throughout the closures um, time. And then obviously um, our access to to the actual um, address uh, where the incident is occurring. Um, so we we did work uh, this department, public works, uh, where we went to the Waterfield barriers that did help some. Uh, where we're able to get someone there quickly, whether it's one of the police officers or, or one of the chief officers there quickly, and we we unload or, or open up the water barriers to get the water out, but there's there's still a time delay there. Uh, but it does give us access. Ultimately, we're set up that any of our apparatus, we can work remotely, um, but the apparatus is designed to be immediately out front of the address. Um, it all comes down to time. Um, and then time and, and labor. So um, individuals, everything from carrying ladders to carrying hose, you already have 70, 100 pounds of, of gear on you. Now you're adding another 100 pounds of, of uh, equipment and you have to go from right in front of the address to a block or two out. It's going to shorten the time that our individuals can, can work. Um, and then obviously the health effects associated with it. So 
granted, I'm, I'm painting the, the extreme picture to you. Um, I just want you to be aware. I'm not here to stomp my feet or anything like that. We're ultimately, we're, we're going to uh, be of assistance either way. Um, but I can tell you um, from now having trained multiple times with the closure in place and also with actual real incidents in the closure, it greatly delays our ability to do things like this. Chief Moorhead, uh, I'll try not to repeat anything that Chief Pelham has said. I'll just add to the conversation that partnered in 2020 because it was a necessity to keep our restaurants open. And it was the right thing to do at the right time. It was very successful uh, because of everyone staying home. The traffic pattern change worked. 2021, we saw the complete opposite. Uh, traffic was um, a lot more difficult than it was in 2020. The officers had a very difficult time traversing around the borough. Additionally, uh, last year was, you know, again, a year where we saw vehicle borne attacks. Most memorable was out in Wisconsin, uh, parade. Extremely fearful of that. And we tried to put safety measures in place in 2020. I think those measures were correct. I think we relaxed those in 2020 to work Junction with the fire department with the water barriers on the west sides of the blocks. If we move towards this decision, I want to make sure that we start having a serious security conversation under Mayor Norley at the time I submitted a plan for safer barriers uh, that are a two person operation to put in and take out very efficient. They do come at a cost and I forward that to you. So you have the updated version of that. And then the final thing I'll, I'll just throw out along with the Harmony project is recently we've seen uh, closure of Jennersville Hospital and Brandywine Hospital and that traffic's coming here. We're seeing an influx of, of ambulances. Uh, Chief Brogan will have more data on that if you, if you choose to get it. And, you know, we're just seeing an awful lot of uh, emergency vehicle traffic coming from the south up through High Street Corridor and when you shut down uh, Gay Street and put you know the stop signs in. It's it's going to impede and slow that traffic as well. So just uh, again willing to work with. I think uh, 2023 is a better year maybe with the Harmony project, but we'll we'll see how it goes. So thank you. Yes, I wear. Uh, I'm the president of Chester County EMS Council. Uh, state law requires that county and local governments have an advisory body to EMS. I'm the current president, so we've done a lot of work with the hospitals. Uh, we really uh, dug into the data of how many hospitals are going to Jennersville, how many patients are going to Jennersville and Brandywine. Uh, and we expect about 6,500 ambulance patients are going to get diverted to both Chester County and Paoli. Uh, what we've seen over the last 30 days, though, is the majority are coming to Chester County, uh, not so much Paoli, just because it's closer. So. Um, out of that, I would anticipate about 2,000 more ambulances are coming to Chester County every year uh, that we didn't see before. Did I answer your questions? So just a couple from the bid perspective of a couple items, um, and not to refute anything on the emergency services side. On the EMS side, obviously Chester County does see a large amount of people, but I think if we ask Chief Brogan, you know, the ambulances are either coming from the south up High Street or they're coming off of 100, so coming south down North High Street, um, or they're coming off 202. So in terms of Market Street specifically or Gay Street, it, they are not being super utilized by outside companies, be my guess, and I'm sure the chief kind of could give us a little more information about that. This is going to take a little innovative thinking to try and pull off, but I think we need, I think, in Westchester to need to find ways to say yes to things and try new innovative approaches. It's the easy reflection to just say to no from that. And, you know, that's not any shot at the fire department or police department. They have their job to, and their constituent to represent just as, as I do, and that's what I'm doing here. Um, if we do go back to the memo document just real quick, I kind of wanted to outline what steps. So this would be the third page on the memo document. Now, just at the top, the how is where we can go down to. So 
I was tasked by the Public Safety Committee in November, so it was a different Public Safety Committee, to get together with the borough manager, codes, public works, fire department, police department, and kind of begin the discussion on what the Gay Street open air market could look like in 2022. And one of the first things we wanted to do with this memo was to kind of instruct council on what the challenges are and the opportunities and how we could go about implementing this. Um, so because we have a number of new members of council, you know, first we think council should kind of determine if they want to try at least to do an open air market in 2022. Um, I think I have a feeling on where council is on that, but if, I think it would just be best that there's at least public discourse that that's where council supports us continuing that conversation. If they determine that, you know, this is something we want to pursue, the next step is, you know, what the borough manager was outlining with if we have local control or not. I would advise council to direct the borough to apply with PennDOT for the special events application as we've done the last two years just in the case that if we the local control gets hung up or it gets stretched out a longer period than what we expect, if we can at least begin the process now, it gives the borough the option to go if they want. That doesn't mean that you receive the application and the approvals from PennDOT or the U.S. Department of Transportation and this PICO project has not been resolved and it's not in the best interest to move forward this year, that we have to move forward, but it gives you that flexibility. If you wait and we have to go through PennDOT, that's a very onerous project. And then you're talking mid, you know, summer until you could possibly get the actual approvals that you need. The next step, because a question we've always had is, is this going to be a weekend focus? So it would run like, you know, Thursday evening through Monday morning or Friday through Monday morning, or is it going to be the whole week as it's traditionally been? Uh, the issue there becomes barriers, public works. And I think the borough manager can express that tonight. We don't have the infrastructure or the manpower to be able to move barriers the size of the concrete bin blocks every week. So, you know, council would then, and I don't think we should put Chief Moorhead on, on the spot tonight, but he's, he has done some homework on this, a recommendation for what level of barriers the police department thinks and what level of barriers council wants to see. That'll determine whether or not you can do a weekend focus or, the, or you're forced to do the entire week. Um, and then, based on that, you can kind of start to understand what the costs are of, you know, the full implementation. Uh, the, what time of the year? Um, I would personally suggest a Memorial Day through Labor Day this year. I think that's kind of feasibly where we're at. You know, when we did the survey, we talked, you know, April through October or Memorial Day through Labor Day or permanently closed at 365. PennDOT's position as of right now is that they're not okay with the th closing at 365. So I think that's kind of been answered for us. So, and with this PICO work, I think trying to ask for an April through October is a harder path to getting something done. Then, you know, obviously we're gonna continue to work with emergency services to make sure we have proper contingencies for them, uh, both for police and for fire. So they have access to blocks that might be closed. And then finally kind of creating that rules document that we normally do. So that's kind of the process as we outlined here. I think the Gay Street Open Air Market has been a success. The last two years have been a pandemic level response. And now that Omicron's starting to recede and we're starting to realize that it's more of a function of living with COVID and it becomes endemic, Borough, because this is a public asset, really needs to focus on a long-term plan of what they wanna see Gay Street look like. And it is a good attraction for the town I think Westchester is the premier destination, but we have to be cognizant of the fact that places like Kennett Square, Media, Downingtown, Phoenixville, Pottstown are all trying to innovate, try new approaches to attract new residents, to attract new businesses. And Westchester has to be part of that. If not this, then at least trying something new to create new buzz about town. I think the open air market accomplishes that. So that's, I don't know if there are further questions that you have. I know that we're probably well over our time and I've eaten up a lot of it, but I appreciate the consideration. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you. Logan. There are a lot of variables here, right? So, I, you know, we're, I don't wanna say on the other side of the pandemic, but the, the level of urgency is mm -hmm. not there, but the, the new variable is having two 
primary thoroughfare close at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And what that presents. So I, obviously we're not going to be able to make those decisions or recommendations tonight. And I would venture to say it's going to be quite a discussion next week that may even fall into March. Um, I am in favor of sort of pursuing the closure concurrently in the event that we find some use your word innovative way to make this happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think that there are different challenges this year than there have been yeah. 21 and 2020 Absolutely. Um, that are going to require, you know, a different sort of thought process. So Sheila, I don't know if you have anything additional to add to that. So I'm new here. I am an industrial designer, so that I, I design products. I come up with innovative solutions, new ideas that my clients get excited about. I take those ideas from concept into manufacturing and I work with engineers to make them a reality. The engineers are naysayers. They say, you can't do that. We're not going to be able to. And what I'm seeing is a room full of extremely helpful engineers. You guys have amazing insight. You understand what is going on. Now it's my job to keep saying, but how can we? And get your input into how this can become a real reality, a, a reality that is viable, that has solutions in it, that, that takes into account all of the problems that you've presented. We need to look at these problems and we need to analyze them completely. We need to do a thorough job. I own properties in some of these other places that you're talking about, and I'm watching Spring City is doing amazing work right now. Who even goes to Spring City? But they're doing huge leaps and bounds to make themselves stand out and look better. Westchester needs to do more. We need to attract new retail opportunities. We need businesses thriving and booming, and we need activity. We need buzz. We need that message out there. But how do we do it safely and thoughtfully and taking into account all of the, the updates that need to be done to the roads because those things need to come first so that's I, I think this is very very heavy and i want to be part of it okay so more to come yes. next week and number eight approve the minutes the december 2020 minutes for public safety Questions or comments, changes? Claire? Uh, and other business. Two quick items on behalf of the police department and Stacy King, who's the civil service secretary. The police department is requesting respectfully from borough council to consider beginning the hiring process for new officers. Currently have two officer vacancies and we are budgeted to replace those two officer vacancies. So we're looking to seek full council approval to begin that process. Uh, listen to the suggestions that have come from diversity task force. We have some, some great ideas ready to launch, get this process up and running as early as the end of February, if we get the approval and then the test would take place in April. Uh, conceivably uh, not be hiring those two new officers until late fall at the earliest. Uh, so even though we're budgeted for that full complement of 44 for the year 2022, uh, we will continue to save those salaries throughout quarters of the year. The second item is that a civil service, again, through Ms. King, uh, civil service secretary and, and civil service, they're requesting to hire a solicitor to assist them with legal matters. Uh, civil service has, has interviewed a solicitor and a letter has been sent to council for that item for consideration as well. Uh, questions? Those are the two items I wanted to seek public safety committee's vote 
to take to full council next week. I'll take those. May I add one sure. point of clarification? I believe also you spoke about in the memo I saw uh, not only generating an eligibility list for hire, but an eligibility list for promotion. Thank you, Sean. Uh, one of the retirees, uh, or I'm sorry, the only retiree, because uh, we, we heard the, the vacancy all of 2021, uh, but the officer who just retired on January 21st, Christopher Craig, was a corporal. Uh, that rank is now vacant, and according to the collective bargaining agreement, we have to fill that that promotional spot within a period of time. So I'm seeking to begin the promotional process for the rank of corporal at this time as well. So those three items, thank you. Sorry, I was taking notes. Um, I am going to take the last item first and the solicitor. And I think as a general practice, I ask for correction here that we would consider um you know two or three different proposals before we made a decision so i understand we've got one in hand but i don't know that we actually put a bid out or an rfp for that that uh contract as a general practice that's a good practice to follow patrick i don't know if you have any comments or anyone on council here um wants to comment on that uh, professional service contracts uh, don't have to be technically bid, but it is common practice to put out a request for qualifications, detail what services you want, get a response so you know what the professional's experience are and what their hourly rates are, and then you can compare. You can even sit down and interview the people, or you can compare um, rates and and other qualifications. That's one way to do it, uh, but uh, you don't necessarily have to do it that way. Any comments? The, uh, just in, in the past, uh, this decision has been left up to the Civil Service Commission. According to the borough's adopted rules for civil service under 2.7, uh, the governing body shall furnish the commission to fulfill its duties. In addition, the commission may retain counsel or any other consultants, experts, including physicians, psychiatrists, as they see necessary. The elected appointed officials of the borough shall assist the commission with a reasonable and appropriate effort, including compensation for any counsel or experts retained by the commission. So I would say that's that's in line to have a discussion with uh, borough council. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um... And if I understood, and I don't have the civil service document in front of me, they can enter into contracts for its benefit of the borough? Yes. In, in having a conversation with Mr. Polito, who's the chair of the Civil Service Commission, um, we're in agreement, though, that this discussion should, should take place at council. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, then as far as hiring and promotion, so we would start the process all over again, correct? So I'm, we, I'm sorry. we would start this, the hiring process all over again with a new list and going through that. Uh, correct. We, we currently don't have a list. The list was retired in December of this past year. Okay. So we need to begin a entirely new process. Okay. And I'd be interested in learning more of those uh, diversity courses undertaking. Sure. Okay. Any other comments? Thanks, Chief. Any other business? Done. Meeting adjourned at 6:34. Thank you for your patience.